everybody. Uh, welcome to another Good Friday. Um, and I'm not at home. I'm not at the cabin. If you're wondering where what, where where I am, I'm I'm at some uh, place in Frederick, uh, about to do a recording on uh, talking about medical cannabis. So I had to do it this way today. So a couple of different news. Um, they're all kind of not necessarily good or bad. There just is. So one, if you're wondering what happened with Paxlovid access in nursing homes. Um, it's interesting question because turns out many nursing homes refused to provide Paxlovid to the patients sick with COVID there. And it's not very clear exactly what happened because obviously the medication cost was covered. Uh, from my understanding of the situation, there was a confusion about access to Paxlovid from larger suppliers. You know how when you were physician writes you an order, you go to the pharmacy and you get it. Uh, that's not how nursing homes buy the prescription medications. They have to get it from a sub larger supplier, and it's a specific supplier. And apparently the claim is that the suppliers somehow were lacking access to it. I think a lot of this is going to get quickly unraveled, and some head's going to roll. That's what I'm thinking, because um, if, if you're interested in the topic of regulation of nursing homes, we're going to see some interesting dilemma. Basically, it's a lot of patients did not get the appropriate treatments. And that probably costed some lives. I think we're going to get to know a lot more in upcoming next few weeks about that. So that's one interesting news. The second is really good. Uh, Dem Dem Democrats are pushing aggressively to keep the tests free indefinitely. Um, so if you see this uh, and if you have time and you're politically active, please call your representative and support this aggressively because Otherwise, I think what, what's going to happen, um, the tests are going to start becoming pretty costly. I've already heard from two of my patients, they tried to get tests because their tests were expired and either they couldn't access them quickly or they were pretty pricey and they didn't want to do it because they were not sure whether they had symptoms, if the symptoms felt, you know, were COVID or not. So that's a very, very, I think, good, good news. Um, and I think the last one is fascinating that I was just reading about is that apparently there is now an accurate COVID air detecting test, meaning it's not testing you, it's testing your home or some other home. So you walk in somewhere and you can uh, take a sample of the air and test it for COVID. That actually could be really, really cool. Let's say you have a large event about to happen and you want to start the event and your event's gonna last for, I don't know, let's say a couple of days. You can periodically test the air uh, instead of testing individuals because let's say you have 30 people in there doing 30 tests on each person is gonna be pretty expensive and potentially quite inefficient because potentially only one of them sick, right? So testing the air could give a tremendous advantage. So stay tuned. Uh, I, what I will do is, let's see how I'm going to do this. I'm going to send the link uh, to myself, and then I'm going to post this in the chat, and we'll make sure, I'll send it to Janet too. We'll make sure that we have that link posted to everybody. So that's all updates I have. That's about five minutes as usual. So let's hit questions. You know the drill. Put the questions in the chat. Uh, and we'll go from there. How can I help you? Somebody is not muted. All right. Um, you guys, when you're sending me a private messages, can you let me know if you want that to be discussed or if I, if you want me to answer that uh, to you only, because I'm always getting confused by that. Cases going down, that's a good question. Cases seemingly going down, I think that's a good thing. Um, now, of course, everybody's still worrying that the, when we hit the fall, the situation is going to change again. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know. The problem is that now we're not tracking exactly what's happening with the strains. Uh, last week, we talked about this new strain, uh, 1.16. Um, that is a bit more contagious than the standard Omicron, but not more severe. So 
the one that comes from India, the sourcing of it is in, from India. That is ex expected now to really kind of become a predominant strain in the upcoming few weeks. But if that's going to happen, it's still not going to be any worse than the current situation. And at least until the fall, I don't think we're going to start seeing any spiking again. Yeah, Al, um, I'm just real quick. I don't think I can answer that quickly. I think we, we you and I are going to have to figure out how to come, get in touch with each other about this. I, I don't think I'm going to answer that in public because it's a bit too personal. OK, new boosters, right. Uh, by the way, that's the you seeing that link. That's the link to this new air test. A new booster is only recommended for some. Yes. So I am nothing changed since three weeks ago when WHO first made an announcement that uh, vaccinating everybody is no longer good. Is Misha frozen for everybody else? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Misha, you might want to leave and come back in the room. Okay, thank you all for your patience. So besides Mark Webster, who is coming to us from New Zealand, is anybody coming from a, to us from uh, someplace far away? Nope. You win, Mark. Yay. I think I also <laughs> win for getting up the earliest. Always. Always. It looks like Mark's coming from space somewhere. I feel like I'm coming from space. <laughs> it, it's 6.11 a.m. Saturday morning here, everybody. And have you had your coffee, Mark? No, I have not. No. Oh. Bless you. <laughs> sorry for the noise. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I'm sorry, you guys. I think I just got kicked out. I don't even know what happened. It was perfectly fine, and then I was connected. Um, I think I was answering the booster question, right? So, um, only immunized, that's when the boosting is recommended at this point. And I actually expect that not to change unless something really horrible happens in the fall. And for that, stay tuned. So, if you are under 65 and you don't have any medical problems, honestly, I don't see any reason you should be boosting. Boosted, unless, of course, you haven't had the first round of vaccines or you never had COVID, which it wouldn't be a booster, right? It would be the primary set. So, that was that question. So, let's see if there's. You have. I was gone. You have to retype it because I don't see them. I don't see any questions now. In fact, I don't see anything in the chat at all. Well, there may be no more questions, and that's fine. We'll give more time for my better half to uh, teach you stuff. All right, well, uh, I got a pleasure to introduce Angela, um, who is going to talk to us 
actually she's going to do the wellness talk and then it's going to give you a little bit of a flavor of the practice after and uh, if you have questions that you remember i says i'm not going to be here just uh, send it to janet she'll pass it on to me otherwise i'll see everybody next week Hi, everybody. Just sound check. Can you hear me well? Yes. Close enough. Okay. So, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here again. I um, gave a couple mindfulness experiences in the presentation, not the talks in the past. And I think there were different, uh, some related to Chinese medicine, which I practiced for about 20 years. And uh, some related to um, some biggest nerve exercises, which I, um, which comes from my somatic experiencing um, practice. Um, that's been going on since it's about five years now. Uh, I do combine it together with body work, acupuncture. So when I did somatic experiencing um, mindfulness experience, the practice here, I realized that I like I wanted to um, share some um, ideas and concepts, some foundations, and we didn't have time for that. So uh, Janet uh, generously offered me to do both today, so I could kind of share with you some um, like a foundation for for the experience, and I think that will just uh, lead us to a little deeper um, practice and understanding. So I don't know how many people here are familiar with um, somatic experiencing and it's not everybody is on screen so I can't really just ask you to wave the hand but I assume maybe some of you know and it's kind of in the air everybody uh, uh, a lot of practitioners started to um, you know kind of be aware about that uh, a, a, a method of working with trauma through uh, somatics through through body experience. Um, so the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to actually mix it up. It's not like I'm going to do a lecture first and then practice. I'm going to do a little bit of expl exp uh, explaining and then a little bit of experiencing. And then again, because that's what how actual um, session, SE session goes. So a bit of a talking, a little bit of a, um, experiencing, a bit of a processing, body work, touch sometimes, which I can't do today, but um, uh, yeah. So SE, I'm going to probably use this abbreviation so I don't have to say again and again, somatic experiencing is a therapeutic modality that focuses on healing trauma and stress-related disorders, which is most are chronic conditions, a lot of them, it, or most of them have this component of being stra uh, stress-induced or stress-aggravated uh, by working with body sensations and physical responses. So it's not completely new idea. It goes back to a psychology, it probably goes back to a lot of thousands of years ago, of course, when mindfulness was, um, you know, a part of life. Uh, but in the modern world, it probably goes way, uh, way to um, um, Freud's, uh, Freud's student, um, Willem Reich, psychology, who um, introduced this idea of body armor, something that we put on, like a body with a muscle tension that comes with a stress response. So, but it's been really um, developing in the past, maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, past 30, 40 years. It aims to resolve physiological, emotional imprints of trauma to restore the sense of safety and well-being. So while uh, as easy, quite unique approach, it's one of the oldest um, developed, but there are, of course, there are others now, and maybe you've heard of, you know, with similar principles, maybe you've heard of uh, sensory motor psychotherapy, Hakomi method, trauma release exercises, TRE, mind-body centering, um, EMDR, which is probably most um, familiar, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing, 
and many others. Even like yoga has some of these ideas uh, when it's used therapeutically. Um, but there are some features that are quite unique to SE. And um, even though the SE goal is very simple, it's teaching uh, autonomic nervous system, which is kind of equate the body uh, to self-regulate, to optimize window of tolerance. So the way we feel comfortable in the world and increase coherence. And coherence is probably could be equated to the word well-being. So how to do all this, of course, it's not so easy, uh, but um, that's why the method was developed. So just to throw in a few, uh, I, few you know, terms, uh, so you feel comfortable in the map, in the, in the territory. Um, so coherence, as I mentioned, is basically well-being. Uh, it refers to harmonious uh, functioning of all the systems in the body, like the, when they function uh, in coordinated way, uh, it signifies the state of optimal regulation and integration with, uh, within the nervous system. So this st state supports uh, overall well-being, but not only emotionally. It's it's not only resilience. It's actually kind of translates into just physical well-being as well, just being healthy. And that's what enables us to respond very in a healthy way to all the stressors in life and adapt to them. So what is window of tolerance? Um, it represents a balanced state where a person can comfortably handle and adapt to life, basically, to all the stressors without becoming overwhelmed or dissociating, even though those things can still happen sometimes in, in a healthy uh, individual as well, but we don't, how, like in a normal, healthy way, we don't get stuck in those experiences. So encompasses a range of physiological, emotional, and cognitive states where a person feels safe and connected to, to the world, to themselves and, and to the surroundings. Um, so somatic experiencing is especially pays attention to this physiological um, and then emotional and then cognitive states, but it kind of goes from what it's called bottom up, from physiology to uh, emotions, to cognitive states, uh, which is um, the opposite of top-down approach. That's what usually talk therapy does and a lot of mindfulness practices. And, and they're not, the, they're opposite kind of in the, in the approach, but they're, uh, of course, um, uh, complementary. We need both. And we end up doing one, we end up not doing the other, of course, too. Um, but for a while, the body was a little bit kind of too far from, from therapeutic approach, and now it's it's back. So we can learn from the body and allow the body to lead our healing. Um, so, and then I'm gonna start kind of going a little bit closer to the experiential part. So one of the important things that every time we do. Uh, we work with trauma. We want to um, make sure that we know what's safe, how to how to feel safe. And for a lot of people, it's not very easy, but there are simple things we can at least begin with. So in somatic experiencing, um, one of the most, one of the simplest, most beautiful um, thing we do is organic orientation. Organic means very natural. That's what we do anyway but sometimes we um, don't do enough of it. We, maybe because of trauma, we kind of stop doing that. And this is something because it's from body, it's not very conscious. So all these ideas, it's like, I'm talking about them, but the work is actually kind of almost nonverbal. So there is a challenge, of course, to putting together, um, speaking of something and having experience of that. So something that happens organic, uh, um, that's that's what's natural. So organic orientation is one of the biggest and probably the primary resource that we we can use. And I want to introduce that first. And, and actually just this as a resource today. So let's do it simple. So SE places very strong emphasis on the body in, 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 in inherent capacity to heal and regulate itself. So it recognizes um, that 
like trauma can disrupt, as I just said, some of the organic natural resources. So we, by, by using, by just practicing them, we kind of bring them back into, into this, into natural state. Uh, and then, so orientation is when, let's say, any, any animal, any human being, like, gets into the new environment and what we need to do we need to check it out we need to orient ourselves to check it if it's safe for us and the first thing that we use uh most of us of course not everybody we use our eyes we use we just look around so you know as long as we have vision in place we can do that if we don't have vision we can use other methods but of course for us vision is is a huge thing so every time we enter the room, what we do, we look around. So we'll come back to that and we practice, we're gonna practice that. And um, a couple other practical things that we do in SE is also we track, we track sensations and like sensory awareness. So tracking means noticing, noticing without trying to change it. If something changes, as we notice, it's fine. So we notice change or we just notice what's there. So it's not like a relaxation when you tell yourself, oh, I'm noticing this sensation and I'm letting myself to relax. So at this level, we don't, we don't have intention to change things through our consciousness, through our mind. So we learn to notice small changes in the body because that's gonna helpful in processing. So th those are essential cues in trauma resolution. So in practitioner, uh, helps, of course, to track because we can see what's happening and it's an internal sensation. It's also maybe small body movement, um, muscle movement, um, change in a posture, change in a, even skin appearance. So it's it's a lot of things. Uh, but uh, even, even small things can just start from noticing some, just a couple, maybe small things. Uh, and then um, two more important features of somatic experience is titration and pendulation. So this is just, I just want to introduce these two terms. And then I will, when we do practice, I will kind of come back. So circle around and I will say like, okay, that's what we did or that's what we could do. But I just want you to... Um, learn a little bit about that. So titration is because, as I said, the main thing is the safety. We work in SE, we work with trauma or with stress, with nervous system. We begin in a safety and we always have tools how to get into safe place. And uh, we use titration to ensure that. So titration involves breaking down overwhelming experiences into very small, very almost minute, uh, more changeable pieces. So that's that's how the process is going. Uh, so it's not relieving trauma. It's not kind of you know throwing yourself into that. It's taking teeny tiny pieces and working with them, and then they eventually they kind of you know become coherent in kind of almost like a puzzle pieces together. Uh, but that is not a big picture. It's not even important because what we do, we um, we train nervous system to um, to process those little pieces and um, and uh, learn how to stay with those experiences within the window of tolerance. By very slow, it's a very slow process. We kind of have to slow everything down and we very very gradually gradually explore. Um, traumatic material and allow our nervous system to process it in a very controlled manner when safety is available. And pendulation is like a last term probably gonna introduce is refers to, we can do it again and again, like go back and forth, it's kind of a dance. We allow ourselves to experience something difficult and then we go into safety and then allow ourselves to go to experience something difficult again, maybe for a little bit longer maybe for a few seconds longer and then go back again. And our nervous system learns how to do that, how to go back into safety. And then it just feels really, you know, very 
empowered and um and things don't become don't feel as scary anymore in the future as well not just in the past so this is kind of going uh this moment between activating and the resourceful state safety it, it just helps to build resilience um i'm not going to talk about polyvagal theory maybe a lot of you are familiar with that but for the purpose of today's practice i don't think it's we need to go in there but even though it's a theory, it's hypothesis, it's not completely proven, but practically polyvagal theory makes sense for probably all body workers, a lot of people who work with um, stress in the body. So that's that's there. So last, some of my uh, experience, uh, mindful experience were about how we can help our vagus nerve to be stronger. Um, Okay, so let's do um, a little deep into practice, a deep into a deeper practice. So we said orientation, safety first. So, and we said orienting response is a natural reflex that involves scanning the environment, uh, including your own inner sensations as well. Uh, with the eyes to gather information, orient ourselves, to check everything, to know we are safe. So let's let's try that. And first, before we do orientation, let's just for the moment notice where we are right now without without trying to change it, but if something is fluid, dynamic, that's great to notice too, but let's just pay attention for a few moments to our breathing. To our posture. Again, you don't need to change anything right now. It's just noticing. Just sense your inner sense, like what we call inter uh, interception, like how you just feel inside overall. Is it discomfort, comfort somewhere in your body? Are you relaxed? Um, just this sense of your inner, inner physiological self. Just breathing is a part of that too. But maybe you can sense your belly, sense your chest. Also notice if you if you have any emotional state, it could be very neutral, feeling very neutral, or have some emotional presence, any effect. Maybe it's just the day that has some emotional Kind of flavor or you're noticing maybe there is a little bit of a curiosity what's coming next basically just checking with yourself and not everything has to be feeling good of course whatever it is so and now um with um open eyes with rather relaxed focus, let's just look around and just what what my favorite name for this exercise is it's an eye, eye movement orientation exercise, but I call it take your eyes for a walk. So just look around uh, and scan your place in all directions and try to move your eyeballs a little bit more than your neck. So it's not it's not about turning the neck, it's more about moving your eyes. So looking left and right and slowly, slowly. Um, noticing objects, maybe colors, any movement. But don't stay too focused on anything for too long, just keep scanning. 
and keep breathing. And notice if you kept your breath a little bit, if you held your breath for a moment when you were doing that. You may feel a little bit of a, even like a stretch of the muscles that move the eyes. That's good. But don't, don't force it too much. Okay, I'm just gonna give you like 10 seconds to complete that on your own. Okay, and now we can stop and allow your eyes to relax, come back to neutral position and notice if you wanna take a deeper breath, allow that. And if you feel like you wanna close your eyes at this point, you can do that too. And now again, sense your body, sense this, everything about your inner state. And notice what feels the same, what feels different. So anybody noticed any difference? Does it feel a little bit calmer, maybe? A little bit more grounded? All right. You can, by the way, if you want, you can type something in the chat, but you don't have to, you can just, yeah. So somebody said, I'm able to take a deeper breath. Yeah, definitely. And if you did notice that you were not actually breathing deeply, or maybe not even, I wouldn't say probably you stopped breathing, but when you were looking around, your breath was probably shallower, I would guess. And then after this, doing this and closing your eyes, your breath has become deeper. So this is very consistent with this, what, what just happened. Because if you imagine you're in a new place, you need to check it out. You don't know if it's dangerous or not yet, right? So you don't want to make any noise. You don't want to breathe heavily. You want to just hold your breath a little bit to be able to be very alert. And then when it's safe, your nervous system tells you that it can breathe. So it's kind of, that's why this, why, that's why this, this happens naturally. And that's why this called organic orientation. Because we all do that. Even if we, you know, if, if, even if the room is not new, even if the room is same and we enter it every day, it's a great thing to do. So if you you can notice if you're doing that. And if you're not doing that, you can start doing that for just a quick few seconds. Okay. So, um, so and then I wanna introduce briefly three states of autonomic nervous system, which you're probably more or less familiar with, but the way I wanna represent it so we can use it in practice. So it's in a, a bit simplistic way. So the, for the purpose of practice, we can describe three zones of our functional range of nervous system. We're gonna call them green, red, and blue. So neutral. Neutral is green. It's when we're present, engaged more or less, relatively calm, relatively balanced, able to do things or rest, kind of respond to the needs of this situation. Our mind is kind of present, but it's not racing. So emotions are even more or less. We can feel them, but they're not overwhelming. Heart rate, if we look at the body, heart rate is kind of normal. Breathing is even and moderate. So everything is just fine. 
to the degree that we don't even think about it. We don't have to think because it's everything is okay. So this green uh, zone, we can call also calm and connect. So, and I do hope that most likely you feel that's the way you feel now. My, my guess would be, unless you had something, you know, stressful earlier and you might maybe keep coming to that. So check with your body and try to notice and describe to yourself how you know that somatically you are okay, doing well. You're open, curious, relaxed, open to experience, open to follow friendly suggestions for these exercises and so on. It's kind of similar to what you just did after um, the eye movement exercise. So in SE, this is all about slowing down these moments and noticing how you how you know that you're okay right now. Sometimes you can't put it in the words and it's fine. But just let yourself grasp that sensation. So the second zone, uh, red, it's what it's called uh, sympathetic dominance. It's activation, arousal, uh, mobilization. All these terms are used. So it's fight and flight. It's kind of alert. And it could be with or without threat. So generally, the way you can recognize the state is like your blood is pumping. You may experience some heat coming kind of heat wave coming through the body, the heart beating, change in breathing. Actually, it could, it could be rapid breathing or it could be shallow breathing. It could be even like breath is stopped. Muscles are tense, especially legs and um, uh, arms. Um, you may notice some dryness in the mouth. Uh, your eyes are open. Definitely you don't want to close your eyes in this state. You don't, not that you don't want to, but you just don't. So this is a red zone, and this is all natural responses. Like we evolutionary design uh, to uh, stay, to use this state to keep us safe. So we can respond to any situation uh, as soon as we can. Um, so what is different about, um, so what's different is the type of danger, if it's any danger and what's, what's the danger is. So why we often call that sympathetic dominance is not healthy, and it is not. So staying too long in this state is not healthy. It just really consumes a lot of energy and, um, and makes us, makes all these chronic conditions kind of to eventually develop. So compared to animals, they have like a quick stress, quick danger, they go into fight and flight, and then they kind of, and it's over and then they can relax and maybe that comes again, but it's like, you know, situation over, situation over. We in our life, in human life, have a different type of stress and different type of danger. Uh, we, um, uh, for example, something that animals probably rarely experience is inappropriate caregiving in child, childhood, prolonged stress that never ends, like deadlines at work, financial difficulties, uh, technological danger, like all these very fast moving things, you know, vehicles, um, constant overwhelm of the system. There is no uh, up and down. There's no like boom and then relax, like animals can do that. So if flight is not possible, if fight is not possible, which is almost never, we cannot feel feeling, you know, safe, safely fighting in our society, then flight, and if, if flight is not as, uh, possible, then freeze. So we are activated internally, very tense, but externally in appearance, we kind of like, you know, blank. Uh, so it's very, it's very common in, for us, but very uncommon in, in the animal world. So for us, it's, it, it, it happens, um, it's just, I mean, freeze in the animal world is common, but in uh, constant freeze, is not common. They shake it off and they become like, you know, they go into normal state of nervous system. For us, it happens commonly and partially. So the 
activation and freeze kind of coexist. So because it's what makes us what makes it possible for us to function in this world. So uh, if you're not afraid, let's just go through a little bit of experiential here. So imagine one of those situations. So we now testing the red zone. Imagine one of those situations, any that speaks to you. And according to SE rules, we do it in very small, in very safe, small steps. So for example, you're home alone in the evening, not expecting anyone, and all of a sudden you hear door, doorbell rings. That's the first situation. Second situation, maybe you're driving and the, and the car in front of you is doing something really stupid, like changing a lane, breaks the rule. Or a third situation, well, let's just let's do this too. Like pick one of those and just let us imagine like you experienced that and uh, notice what happens in your body. Imagine it. If your imagination is not as good, maybe you can remember something happened in the past, something really small but stressful. Yeah. Just notice what happens in your body. Any shifts, any changes in the way you breathe, in the way you experience your circulation, your skin, your temperature, your posture, your where your eyes are, um, belly, chest, any emotion arises. Okay, so I can see that um, somebody experiences muscles are tensing. Yes. So whatever whatever you you experience right now, just recognize that, notice that, allow this like for 10 more seconds just to stay with that. Maybe you have to like play it again and again because it's a very short script like the doorbell rang, the car shifted. Okay, and now open your eyes and do the eye movement again for about 20, 30 seconds. Just do the same thing that we did before. Just look around, allow your eyes to see the room. And come to neutral. Maybe you, if you can close, you can close your eyes or stay with eyes open. Take a breath. And notice where you are. Again, predominantly in your body, emotionally. So what you what we're doing now, we're tracking. So remember I mentioned there is a tracking that happens all the time in SE session. So that's what we're doing. We're notice, noticing very small, very subtle changes or states, states or their change uh, in the body, in your nervous system, in your emotions.
Okay, so again, you can relax and we'll do a third zone, um, which is relaxed, parasympathetic, kind of vagal dominance that we call, uh, let's say blue color, because usually blue is very relaxing. So it's in progression, it's from rest and digest. It goes into meditation, let's say, if you meditate, and then it goes to nap, goes to sleep, goes to deep state of sleep. So that's that's that. Uh, in this state, we recharge, we reset, our mind resets in a deep sleep. Uh, we use our resources, you know, all the nutrition, all these cells are getting whatever they need, more oxygen, more nutrients. We tune up all body functions and we clear our mind, especially in deep sleep. So what we can experience in that state is um, slower heart rate, uh, deep, slower breathing, and muscles are relaxing. And then at some point, we almost like, there's there's not much going on really to say. So it's uh, maybe even not much to notice because that's that's how it's supposed to be because it's a rest. So this is this blue state without threat. And as we noticed before, as we mentioned before, there is something that's called freeze, which is going into that state with a threat and with... Um, I'm kind of doing this for the more advanced kind of situation, but just bear with me. When uh, you your sympathetic system did not relax, but also on the top of that, you kind of put the um, state of dissociation, so to speak, so you can manage the situation. So this is not very desirable blue state, but it happens when we need this. So the again, the main thing is not to get stuck in that. But the good blue state is great. Um, and um, so we don't in, invoke to this state experientially. We probably don't even need to imagine any particular situation in life. So let's just get this somatic sense by simply imagining that you really, really need rest that you need you simply have have to kind of collapse just come to your favorite chair throw yourself in a chair close your eyes let your arms and legs drop and dangle and just like stop your mind and you're at home you're safe you can do that And notice how it feels in your body. Again, maybe there will be not much to notice because this is kind of state of somatic silence, but that's how you know. That's what to notice. That's muscles are relaxing. You want to let go of everything. It's blank. So notice how you experience that right now in your body. Your eyes are closed. So let's just do it for 10 seconds. And now again, gently open your eyes and do looking exercise. You can start opening them slowly and just kind of maybe look very unfocused first. Just be gentle. Sensing the stretch of the eye moving muscles and opening the eyes. 
slowly to the full opening. And just again, arrive into your body and just sense where, where you are. Take a breath. All right. So what we did right now, we shifted ourselves between these zones. So we started in green, then we went into red, then we went to green again, and then we went into blue, and then we went into green again. And we use the resource of eye moving exercise, the natural orientation, organic orientation, to go into the green zone, into safety, the calm and connect, where you just present, engaged. And we did, we, we can do actually several times of this thing. You know, and that would, so to do it once in a small step is called titration. And if we do it several times again, maybe staying with the uncomfortable red in an uncomfortable red zone, if we work with the trauma for a little bit longer, um, and but every time going safely into green, that that's called pendulation. So in real SE therapy, you would be invited to go into tiny experiences of trauma or stress into red or blue freeze, which is also traumatic. Uh, with the simple bits, like just like we did, uh, of body sensations or emotional states, and then go into green. So, and as you go back and forth in each state, you notice your body sensation. This is called tracking. So as a result of this, the whole thing, what we just did, your nervous system gets more comfortable and it learns self-regulation in a way that it's not really much different from just muscle training. And later, uh, traumatic experience becomes more digestive, digestible, coherent in the memory, and uh, we somatically understand something about the process. And uh, this deep tension or freeze, they finally start to let go because body kind of naturally wants to get better. And we recognize that in SE. Um, kind of almost done here with uh with my time and with my presentation um so the one thing that i wanted to mention is that oftentimes in the, like we we think about um stress and relaxation as a state of two so from the stress we try to do some exercises maybe mindful breathing and we think we're going to go into the blue again but it's much it's actually very different it's pretty advanced so it's much easier to go into green than blue. So don't expect like you in the middle of a stress, you can do just some breathing exercises and really feel profound relaxation. This is this is not this is not what's happening in the nervous system, but it's very easy to do a little bit of something and go into green. And in the green, things are manageable. It's more like um from being anxious, angry, or panicky to more neutral, calm, okay, I can handle it, state. Or from freeze, overwhelmed, flaccid, exhausted, absolutely no energy, can't move my hand, go to more neutral, engaged, I can do it little by little state. So today we just used one exercise, one simple thing, eye movement to do all of this. But of course, there are many other techniques that all these therapists that in, in SE also uses, like breath work, using breath in different ways, using muscles, posture, movement, even water exposure, voice, touch, biofeedback, EFT, the tapping, acupressure, so everything. Everything could be um, helpful to train yourself how to go into green zone. And that's my... Um, that's all I wanted to do today. And I, I kind of hope that I had, I would have more time for questions, but there's not that many time, much time left. Sorry about that. But I'm sure if anybody has a question and wants to wait around, um, 
are willing to stay a little longer, I'm quite sure that Angela will answer it. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, what I'm going to do, if you're interested in somatic experiencing, I, I just posted a link to, to their main website where you can find some resources, probably, if you're interested. Excellent. So everyone, uh, I have some news for you. We are going to go on summer break. So Dr. Kogan and I and the rest of the Mindfulness Experience team, we're going to be on break from 721 uh, through uh, August 4th. So we really do need to, to do some uh, rest, relaxation, and recharging. I need to work on scheduling because uh, that's something that's sort of fallen by the wayside of late. So uh, AME will return on August 11th. In the meantime, if you are interested in volunteering and helping me with scheduling, uh, I would appreciate it. All I'm asking is maybe two hours a week uh, to help me reach out to people and um, I'll be the one putting them on the schedule. I just need folks to to do the emails and and um, so we can get speakers and mind body practitioners. So have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy our hot and humid weather if you can. If not, stay inside and stay cool and stay hydrated. Bye.